I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in the YouTube bylaws that if you make tutorial videos that you are contractually obligated to at some time make a tips and tricks video. So here we are. I really like tutorials. I've watched hundreds if not thousands of them. I made this channel to start making my own tutorials about video editing and motion graphics. And I think when you talk about how the internet has changed learning for all time. The internet, so helpful. Tutorials are right at the center of that. But when you either watch or create a tutorial that's hyper-focused on one effect or creating one style, some things slip through the gaps. So here are 10 essential tips and tricks for DaVinci Resolve. And these tips will come to you in the form of a, a numbered, numbered list. list. You couldn't see my little map back there. Number one, how to change the default project settings. When you open up a new project in DaVinci Resolve and go to File Project Settings, you will see the default settings for a new timeline. If you wanna change any of these settings, those changes will only apply to the project you currently have open. If you wanna change any of these so that every new project starts at a different default, this is what you do. As an example, let's say that I am exclusively going to be uploading videos at 720 resolution at 60 frames per second. I would wanna change my timeline resolution to 1280 by 720, and then I would wanna change my timeline frame rate to 60 and my playback frame rate to 60 as well. And then for video monitoring playback inside the program, you would also wanna change that to 720 60. And you can save that. But again, that only saves for the project that is currently open. So back in project settings, you can click up to presets and here you can save as. Choose a name, click okay. And after you've created that preset, you wanna right click and select save as user default config. Then if you create a brand new project and go to file project settings, you will see that the default settings have changed to 720 at 60 frames per second. It's always a safe bet to check your project settings before you import footage, but if you plan for a majority of your videos to be at a certain resolution and frame rate, this can save you the time of changing those settings every time you open a new project. Number two, auto save or live save. There's nothing worse than spending hours on an edit and then something goes wrong, the software or your hardware crashes and you've lost all that work. There is an auto save feature in DaVinci Resolve, but it's not turned on by default because of reasons. Here's how to turn it on. Go to DaVinci Resolve, Preferences, make sure you are on User, and then go to Project, Save, and Load. Here under Save Settings, you will see the Live Save feature. Make sure that is enabled. This will keep a record of every edit you make, and if something goes wrong, if the software closes, you can always open right back up and get going from where you were. If you want a little more security, you can also create project backups, which will create an external file so that if there are any drastic changes, you can always go back and save your work. Number three, the render cache. If you drag an effect or title onto your timeline, you'll probably notice that it will not play back smoothly at first. In order to achieve that smooth playback, you have to go to playback, render cache, user. And then you will see a red buffering bar above that clip. And over time, that will turn to a blue bar. When that process is complete, you'll be able to click play and smoothly preview that title or effect. So what's actually happening here is because that effect is so intensive, it can't be played back in real time. So Resolve needs to create a video file that plays back more smoothly. If you're ever in a situation where you're not getting smooth playback on your titles or effects and you don't see that red or blue buffering bar above your clip, make sure the render cache is enabled. Number four is a quick follow-up to number three, and that is how to deal with the render cache files that are created inside DaVinci. Inside your project settings, in master settings, if you scroll down, you will see optimized media and render cache. Because DaVinci Resolve is a powerful and professional grade software, the render files it creates are extremely high quality and can take up a lot of space. I recommend setting your render cache format to DNX HRSQ. If you wanna save a little more space, you can also select DNX HRLB. If you choose this option, you should be aware that the playback of certain effects and titles might be a little lower quality inside your timeline, but that will not affect the quality of your final export. If you're done with the project and want to delete those files off the computer, one option is to go up to Playback, Delete, Render Cache. And there you have the option for all clips, unused clips, or selected clips. So in this project, since we have this clip rendered, if I just select all, 
you will see that it deleted that blue bar and we'll have to re-render this clip. But the big thing to note is that this process only deletes the render cache clips for the project that is currently open. Inside your project settings, scroll down to working folders and look for a cache files location. Then if you navigate to that location on your drive, you will see the cache clips folder. I haven't deleted my cache for my last several projects, so if I check the size of all of my cache clips, you will see that it comes in at almost 50 gigabytes. If you're done with the project, you can just delete these cache files and get all that storage back on your hard drive. Number five, proxy mode and optimized media. DaVinci Resolve is very powerful and will handle most video codecs really well. But if you're running into a codec that is not playing back smoothly, you want to go to that clip in your media pool, right click and select generate optimized media that will re-render your entire clip in a codec that should play back much more smoothly in DaVinci Resolve. Alternatively, you also have proxy mode. Proxy mode will cut the display resolution of your clip by half or one quarter. And since most of the time you are editing, you're only watching your clip in this small portion of the screen, this can be a really efficient way to save power that can go to effects or titles or something more complicated. Side note, if it ever appears like your playback resolution is slightly lower than your paused resolution, that is because of this setting. If you go into preferences, playback setting, you want to disable performance mode. But if you're running into some performance issues and playback isn't as smooth as it should be, this would be an option to turn back on. Number six, how to bypass color grades and fusion effects on your timeline. This tip is this little control right here. This is especially useful if you're trying to track down why you're not getting smooth playback. So I created an intentionally awful color grade here, but if I go up to this control and disable it, you'll see that it reverts to the default footage. This will also disable any advanced effects you have on your footage in the Fusion tab. And this also works on things like the drop-in Fusion titles. If you disable this while you have a title on screen, that entire title will go black. This can be helpful if you want a quick comparison to your original footage. And also if it gets hit by accident and you're not seeing any of your color grading or titles, this is where you turn that back on. Number seven, secondary transform controls. I don't know if that's what this is actually called, but that's what I call it. When you have a clip selected in your inspector, you will see your main transform options, zooming the clip in and out, changing its position, its rotation. And this is also where you would traditionally set keyframes if you wanted any automation or animation in your project. But sometimes it can be a little tricky trying to dial in exact locations based on just sliding these numbers. Luckily, we have a secondary set of controls for these same tools. Over here in the viewer, you have this option off by default, but if you enable it, you will see an outline over your footage. This can make it very easy to reposition, even rotate, and change any footage or any pictures, any elements you want to add onto your timeline and position them in a very intuitive and tactile way exactly where you want. This can also make setting those keyframes easier. You would still have to click in your inspector to start a keyframe, but then go to where you want your move to end and you can just grab your footage, move it across the scene, and you will see that red line indicating that it is interpolating keyframes over that period of time. And your move is stored and ready to go. And then if you want these controls out of the way, you can just turn off this option here. Number eight, copying and pasting clip attributes. Say for whatever reason, you are extremely interested in your mini map during this gameplay clip. And you want to repeatedly punch into that mini map to show your viewer something important. If you were to cut out a portion of that clip and go to the transform controls, you could zoom in right on that mini map. And after that clip was done, it would go right back. If you wanted to have a clip later in your sequence with the exact same punch in, you could cut that new clip out and repeat that process. Or you could select that first clip, control C to copy, select that second clip and click Alt V, not control V, Alt V to open up paste attributes. Now here you will see all the video and attributes that you would have access to in the inspector and you can select the parameters that you want moved to the second clip. So we changed the zoom and the position. And then if you click apply, you will see that it takes those parameters from this first clip and applies them to that second clip. And you can do that to multiple clips at once and as many clips as you want. This even includes things like 
color correction, specific plugins and their settings, and audio attributes like the EQ for individual clips. Number nine, the keyboard shortcut menu. If you go to DaVinci Resolve Keyboard Customization, you will see this menu. Here you can search through all the possible commands and see if there is a key binding currently set for that. If not, you can add a key binding and you can also search by this visual layout up here. We just talked about pasting attributes with Alt V and if you click Alt V, you will see that comes up over here as paste attributes. If you don't know what a certain key does, you can check it here. Control T adds a transition. Alt I clears your endpoint, and Alt X clears your in and out points. This can be fun just to mess around in, but it can also be very useful if you find a key binding that is not currently being used. For instance, Alt N does not have any active commands bound to it. So I'm gonna go over to my commands, click application down to mark, and then scroll down to set clip color. Here are all the different options I have to mark a clip as a certain color. So I am going to go to orange, click this keystroke and click Alt N. And then you will see it has added that keystroke to that command. And now if I select Alt N on this graphic above, you will see that it's changed to orange. Then you will need to save those key bindings and back in your timeline now, if I select a swath of clips and I click Control N, those clips will be labeled orange because of that key binding I just set up. Key bindings are all about speed. So if you find a command that you think you would use a lot, but it's not bound to a certain key or it's not bound to a key that's easy for you to use, rebind it and start using it to speed up your edits. Our 10th and final tip is not as essential, but it's something I see lots of questions about and it's pretty neat. And that is how to change your starting time code. By default in every timeline, your starting time code starts at one hour. This is a throwback to when everything was shot on giant reels of film. Those reels that never lasted an entire hour, so the hour portion of the time code on the label was used to mark the order of the reels. So reel one would be where your project starts. That's interesting to know, but it can also be confusing, so here's how to change it. If you already have a timeline open and want to change that starting time code, you just right click on your timeline in the media pool, go to timelines and select starting time code. Then you can change that right to zero. To change the starting time code for all of your timelines, you want to go to DaVinci Resolve, preferences, user, editing, start time code. And there you can change it so every new timeline will start at zero. This is also where you would change the default number of video and audio tracks and what audio track type you're using, whether stereo or mono. So there is 10 tips and tricks for DaVinci Resolve, ranging from absolutely vital with something like Live Save to something neat, like your starting time code. I really hope this video was useful to you. If it was, please drop a like and leave a comment below with which tip you are most excited to put into action. I'm also very excited about some of our upcoming videos, so if you don't want to miss any of those, please subscribe. Thanks, I'll see you next time.